Okay, man. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for attending another one of our first Friday um, acoustics workshop online seminar. Um, today we have Professor Chris Rogers from Tufts University and one of his students, um, Lydia. And they will be presenting, um, showing us this piece of measurement software they've been working on for several years now. So, um, Chris, take it away. Thanks, man. So oh, oh, by the way, uh, just an announcement. If you have questions during the talk, um, please um, type it into the chat. We will have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end of the talk as well. So, all right, thank you. Yeah, my my theory is I can't concentrate for more than half an hour, so we'll talk. For, I'll talk for about that, or Lydia and I will talk for about that, and then Joseph's going to show some stuff, and then the rest of the time is for questions that people have. So, uh, so George, that looks really cool. Now, now you got to send me all the uh, files so I can embed it in here too. Um, so, so thanks, Van. Uh, the idea basically is uh, to show off the OB app, which is what we call it. Um, Myself, I've been working on it for many years with Joseph uh, Curtin, and then Lydia is an undergraduate here at Tufts who has been a huge help in getting some of the documentation going, and so she'll show some of that as well. So we've decided this is officially version one. It's uh, B112 for those who have been beta testing for me, and hopefully this will this will work for everyone. So um, essentially, the the original need for this was that. Uh, we need to do something of, about how we can take some input, put it into the violin, and you get some output out, whether it's sound, vibrometry, or, uh, or acceleration. And we, in, a, in standard control theory, you look at it as some sort of a transfer function of how, it how the object takes that input and gives you that output. And, and uh, a bunch of people here have done great talks and explaining all this. And, and uh, the, what you do is you, you look at the ratio, essentially, in frequency space, which gives you the frequency response function. So the software is really only trying to do that. And basically, uh, George had all this stuff all written up, but was uh, tired of having people asking him to change it for, for their needs. So, so he helped me get this started so that uh, we could try and get something that um, would help people share and take data and share it. So more specifically, uh, the need is really to gather data. And right now, it's from a mic, from a vibrometer, or from an accelerometer. But uh, you can't use a lot of the standard off-the-shelf stuff because you want it triggered uh, by the input of the hammer. And again, the idea with a hammer is we try and excite all modes, and then we see uh, what the, the output of the, of the spectrum is of either the sound or the vibration. And the other thing that uh, we, we really wanted to add was the calibration so that we knew what the units actually meant. So uh, we wanted to... So basically, Joseph took me out to lunch. Uh, so was, this is an extremely expensive piece of software. I think it was like 10 bucks um, to uh, measure, to gather impulse measurements and make it easy to gather impulse measurements, make it easy to share your data, um, save your data, uh, keep it free so that anybody can use it, and then uh, allow comparison to known violins. So we actually will automatically put the uh, Titian Strat in and the Jackson Strat in so you can compare to those. but. Our long-term goal is to have a website where people will just be, we'll have some sort of curated place where you can pull down uh, frequency response functions from a bunch of different instruments and see how they work. Um, and we've tried to make it to really build off of all of uh, George's files, formats, et cetera. And we've also brought in a lot of uh, Jim Woodhouse's formats uh, so that we can read those files as well. So that's it. And that's the OB app. That's the talk, I'm done. Uh, so no, the guts. So the guts of it uh, in, inside. It's basically it's written in LabVIEW, um, which if you're not familiar, LabVIEW is probably the largest data acquisition language uh, across the world. It's used from the space station to Mars to everywhere else. But it's a very high uh, high level language. It takes a lot of learning to to get good at it. Basically, so um, so it's open source. You actually can download LabVIEW code. LabVIEW is now free. You can download LabVIEW. You can download the LabVIEW code. And you can go to town, write whatever you want, and it'll be plugins. Uh, and I'm happy to help if people are interested. Uh, it's also easier just to email me and say, it would be so cool if you could do this. Uh, and we can add it. So what I do is I take the LabVIEW code. I build a Mac version and a PC version. Uh, the PC version is nice because it has its own installer. The Mac version doesn't have an installer. So when you install it, you have to unzip it and then tell your operating system that it's not uh, a virus. It's not evil. And so on the website, we give you instructions on how to do that. 
So everything, uh, I've tried to compile everything I've understood uh, on this uh, with the math and everything else up on this site. The, uh, the caveat here is actually my PhD is in fluid turbulence uh, and most of my research is in robotics so and education. So I probably have a bunch of stuff wrong. Um, so I've been leaning heavily on people like Jim and, and Joseph and all to try and get it right. So for those of you who haven't seen the rig, it's a fairly standard setup. There's an impact hammer, you knock the bridge, uh, either at a horizontal position, like uh, this one's aiming to do, or a vertical position, which is knocking the center of the bridge. You pick it up with a mic. Um, you can vary the mic spacing, 20 centimeters from the, the body is typically what I use. Uh, this is one of Joseph's rigs. He's got these nice rotation position adjustments to make it easy to adjust the hammer right away. And then you have some sort of sound card. And I think to date, people have tried something like 10 different sound cards. They, they all seem to do just fine. So any sound card uh, will work. One of my undergraduates this summer is playing around with the idea of replacing the entire sound card, computer, everything with a Raspberry Pi. Um, so if people are interested, I can keep you posted on where that's going to go. So how do we run the tests? Uh, you basically put something in the strings to try and mute them. You mount the violin uh, and then align the hammer. So take the violin, you mount it here. This is a model I hired, does a great job. Uh, align, the, align the hammer and then that's what a hit looks like is, is exactly that. So if, let's do the hit again so you can see because we're going to be playing around a bit with the hits. So it, it looks like that, okay? The, the hit triggers the acquisition. So we grab when the hit happens and then we, and you take a bunch of hits and then we save it. The whole violin itself can rotate. Uh, and of course the mic position can be changed. So to grab the, that hit and uh, make sense of it um, is where the software comes in. So I'm going to jump over to the site and then hand it over to, uh, to Lydia to talk, to walk you all through a little bit on the site. So Lydia, you're up. Great. Hi. Um, so I'll introduce the website and it'll help to work through the software. Um, as you can see, it's split up into different sections. So you can read about the idea and the science behind the app, um, as well as its different features. If you go to the introduction page, um, there is more about, there's links, more links to articles and videos. Um, then you, the biggest part is the instructions for the software, and that's on the software instructions page. You can also go to software setup, which is where you install all the, um, the software and it walks you through for the PC and Mac installation. Um, so on the software instructions, it, they're written instructions for different parts of the software. Um, it's a good way to, place to get started with using it. And also if you need help along the way, just go to all the different sections on the left-hand side um, and you can see how to do that. So I've been working on creating short introductory help videos so that you can see somebody live doing all the different parts of the software live. So it starts with installation, um, there's data acquisition um, and analysis. And these are still in the beginning of stages of development. So we'd love to hear any comments or suggestions about topics to make videos on or different visual aids and formats to do these in. So feel free to email with requests for additional videos as there will be more coming up, but um, this is what we have so far. Okay, thanks. Uh, so two other things I thought I'd quickly throw in there is first, um, this is the link to the YouTube channel that that fans been starting. Uh, so all of the talks go here if, if you want to see those. Um, eventually, we're probably going to redo this entire site into a more general site where people can uh, share data, which is something that Joseph and I have been talking about. All right, let us go back to presentation. So. What actually happens when you run a test? Uh, there's essentially two modes of the software. There's the analysis side and the acquisition side. Um, so you, you start in the analysis side. You can look at all sorts of data sets in the analysis side. 
And then if you um, want to take data, you go uh, to the acquisition side. More than likely, if there's something you want the software to do, Joseph has already asked for it. So it's buried in there somewhere. We just don't have good instructions on to where to look for it. Uh, so that's one of the things that Lydia is going to be working with over the summer. Um, so this is, if we just quickly run this, you can see uh, how you would start a data set. You would go to, um, say, a scratch pad. So we have a couple different modes, a scratch pad mode, where you can just test stuff out. And so you can see some hits on a violin. Uh, and it's modeled again after uh, George's stuff. So it's the, the format is basically the same. We have the Fourier transform of the hammer hit, the actual hammer hit, the microphone. Uh, you can vary a couple different things. This is your, uh, you can filter out everything to the right of the green line is, is forced to zero. Um, there is an orange trigger line, which I'll show you once we up, open up the real software that is the trigger. Uh, so whenever anything on the hammer line is above that voltage, that's what triggers an acquisition. Um, and then here is the frequency response function. Uh, and so there, there are many ways to start a test. The way I recommend for beginners is a there's a getting started button. And that getting started button will walk you through um, how to test. So you either acquire data or you exam, examine existing data. And it will give you hints on how to do both of those. And so let's actually do that. So if I, that's interesting. Let's uh, escape out of this and go to this. So hopefully, can you all see um, a PC screen? Yes. Thank you. So this is the PC in my lab back at home. I was trying to figure out how best to actually uh, run an experiment and not be there. And I almost had a little remote hammer working, um, but it didn't happen in time. So there are a number of different things you can do. Here's the getting started button. If you hit the getting started button, it will walk you through a test. So we can hit the getting started button and you can say, I want to acquire new data or exam examine sample data. If you acquire new data, it'll ask you a few questions. Um, it doesn't let you do all the settings. It just lets you do a few of them. The test structure of how we've actually configured the folder structure is here. So every, uh, Every main folder is, is called an instrument folder. So that's you know, your, your particular instrument that you're studying. Each instrument folder has a number of different tests. So you might be testing different bridges, different weights of the bridge, different uh, sound post positions, whatever it happens to be. Each test can have multiple sets. So that would be like a horizontal and vertical hit. Each set can have multiple positions. So typically, um, Joseph rotates 12 positions around the violin to take uh, a reading. And then each position has multiple taps. So each of these are save, saved in the folder structure, just like this for each of your instruments. So when you share something with somebody, you share all of these different folders. And there's a button that'll do share, zip it all up. And so you can easily email it as one, as one file. Um, but the idea is we save everything, all your raw data. So if at any point you want to go back to your actual raw data hit, it's all there, um, which, is, which is very useful. So you, first thing you do is pick your sound card. So there's my sound card. Um, which port are you connected up to? The microphone is either in port one or port two. If people really want more options, you can tell me. We'll add more options there. But for now, you're limited to port one or port two. Um, and then most of this has been done with the uh, OctaCapture card, um, which it's actually nice and linear, but I'm not a big fan because they won't give me the protocol they use to set the gains. So I can't, in the software, ask for the gain. I can only have you input it. So you have to input the gains. The reason you input the gains is because I then remove the gain from the signal so that we can actually convert it to volts. Um, so enter your two gains for your two channels. The way I typically will find the gains is, gains is by using the scratch pad to mess around with the gains until I get good readings. Uh, you give it a name. So this is the name of the instrument. Uh, and then you say, do you want to do the horizontal, just vertical, or horizontal and vertical? So this would be two sets, horizontal and vertical. And uh, how many mic positions? Uh, so that's, a, that's your rotating around. And then how many taps per position? Then every, every time you take data, there's a notes section that you can keep adding to. So each data set has its own notes, but it builds off an entire instrument set of notes. So you're, we save all the notes from your entire set of measurements on that instrument, and you add uh, for each data set. And we've pre-populated this with some text. Uh, this is what, what Joseph has found useful. 
you can actually change what the pre-populated text is if you have a different setup for your notes. It's totally uh, up to you uh, to do. And then there's a ton of other settings and this would send you into taking data. Instead of taking data though, I'm gonna actually go show you another way of getting in. So the next way of getting in, if you don't wanna do the getting started is the scratch pad. So the scratch pad is basically an area where you can just mess around and change your settings really easily, um, but it doesn't save anything. So nothing is saved, it's just for testing. So I'd recommend playing around in Scratchpad. That's what I showed you in the little video. Um, or you can actually do a test. And when you start a test, you typically start from a template. So there's a whole bunch of templates that, are, uh, that you can run. Uh, we've got some pre-populated, you can make your own. So under settings, which is the other drop-down menu, you can set all your preferences, you can set all your templates, uh, and you can set your calibration. So uh, let's just actually, let's quickly look at those. In preferences, your data folder is your one folder on your machine that stores everything. And I would recommend that being uh, somewhere on like Dropbox where it gets backed up automatically or Google Drive or Microsoft Drive, any of the, OneDrive, any of those. Um, for the vibrometer, if you have a vibrometer, we uh, do all of the serial control so you can remotely control your vibrometer from uh, the software. Uh, views, you can see whether you want it in log linear or log log um, and a bunch of other stuff is your default notes. And when you get super advanced, there's a whole bunch of other stuff you can do with your data sets. Um, but those will be all in Lydia's uh, videos. You can set your templates. So here are a bunch of the things that you can set. So your set names, your output, which channel it's on, what your gains are, what all your thresholds are. Uh, all your calibrations, all that kind of stuff are saved in the templates. Um, and, and then uh, calibrations I'll talk about later. So let's actually go do a set. So if you're starting a new test, you're using a, a certain template you like, you can start typing. If that, if that instrument is already there, it'll automatically finish typing for you. If you want to see all your instruments, um, you can do a drop down and look at all your instruments that you have available. Uh, these are your notes. I'm actually going to say uh, do violin one, which is a data set that I've already taken. Uh, so we can enter it because I can't remotely click it. I can click over here and I can actually see what those settings are uh, and see if I want to change any of them. But if I hit OK, it will uh, send us, has to go through the, the internet uh, a little bit, uh, but it will send us over to the acquire page. And it will hopefully send us over sometime this century. There we go. So here is uh, here's a run, the run I showed in the video from last night. And you can see a couple different things. Up at the top here, you can see how far I am through my run. So these are all the different horizontal runs that I had uh, specified. I can see since I've completed two and I'm in the middle of my third. I'm starting H, uh, H04. So I must be on my fourth. Oh no, sorry, that's the fourth tap. Um, you can see here that I'm running on the OctaCapture. Um, you can see all of these things. So if I want to, for instance, vary my trigger level, I just move, click and move it up and down. If I want to vary the position of my filter, uh, my boxcar filter, I can move that up and down. And you can see in live how it is changing the plot. You can see in the plot a couple of different things. If I click and uh, drag, uh, if I, sorry, show history, I, I can turn off and just see the overall FRF or I can see all the individual hits. If I actually want to see, let's see if I can do this. If I want to see the entire uh, data set and zoom around, I can do the inspect button. Uh, the inspect button, uh, you can actually read the values of stuff. You can zoom in on a certain area and, um, and do a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, so it's, it's fairly useful for just jumping out to quickly look at data um, and wait for this to come back up. I can see uh, there's some chat about the vibrometers. Yeah, they're a little bit cheaper if you buy them in the US. I think mine was like 10 grand. Uh, all right, I'm not sure why the computer is being a little slow. So um, what we can do is while that decides to refresh itself, um, we can go back, well, a couple, I guess a couple of different things. You see, just like in Georgia software, we have the coherence, uh, which is the cross correlation um, and the uh, and the raw data. If you want to change 
the range, you can just click on it and change the number and it'll change the range of your graphs. It remembers all of the ranges that you've used. Um, there also is help. Uh, this gives you some information that might help you out in case you forget. If you wanna see all your settings, they're right here. Um, they're locked because we don't recommend changing settings in the middle of a run. Uh, if you unlock it, you can change the settings. And then here are your notes if you wanna to add to your notes. So that's essentially it. It will tell you that you've changed some of your settings. I moved the, the purple line around. So you can say, do I wanna actually save that in the template or just leave the template alone? Uh, I'll leave the template alone. And it says, all right, do you wanna auto load the data you just took? So I do. And then you can see I can move around with my cursor. It gives me up at the top. You can see this is a frequency of 1,023 hertz, amplitude of 32 uh, dB. You can click on the name of this actually and see more information about it, your notes, um, if you want to remove it from the plot, your settings. So that's I use that a lot to quickly just check and make sure I remember exactly what I was taking. There are a whole bunch of other things you can do here um, in terms of comparing things with, with other things. And let's see if we can zip back over to this. So, so when you actually take a data set, I should have done the data set we just took, um, this is what it actually saves on your folder. So it'll save the, the TRF files. Um, those are in uh, the so-called Stepani format um, so that you can open them up in his software as well. It saves the settings, it saves raw. So these are your raw data files and we save them in a binary format. Um, so I've got, I've written a bunch of translators. So you can put it in MATLAB format. You can put it in CSV uh, or TSV, actually tab delineated format. So you can open it in Excel. And then we also have the uh, averages saved as well. Um, so all of that stuff gets saved. Uh, so the other side is the analyze. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the analyze uh, because I think you guys will be able to, if you, if you want, you can figure it out by just clicking around or watching Lydia's movies, but you certainly can change the color of all the lines. You can auto scale with the Y or the X axis by clicking here. You can go log linear with these buttons. We chose to do this slightly different on the auto scale. Instead of auto scaling for real, what it does is it takes, when you hit Y, it'll take the largest value and put that at the top and then go 40 dB and down in this case. All right, you can also look at bands uh, and you can edit the bands. So you can do band averages and centroids um, and a whole slew of other stuff. And then there's the calibration. So I walk you through the calibration for a bunch of different things. I actually calibrated my sound card to do that, you need uh, to have some sort of function generator that has a known voltage. Um, it's not really necessary. You can calibrate the combination of microphone and sound card with a microphone calibrator. And we'll put up videos on how to do that. Um, calibrate the accelerometer or the vibrometer. And this will walk you through it, all of that. So uh, that's basically it. Where, where to next? Uh, I would suggest downloading it, exploring, asking me any questions you have. Um, there is a fun area, I guess I should quickly show that, where the fun area is things that we're just sort of testing, ideas we're testing, ideas people have given us. Um, they're play around with changing the settings. There's a couple of places where you can have a live view, see, the, see like an oscilloscope, see things running across your screen, uh, try calibrations. Lists is something that Joseph uses a lot, uses a lot, uh, make lists of your favorite uh, violin and then um, and then compare to that list. And then of course, bands and templates. Okay, so what I'd like to do is flip back over to this and give the mic to Joseph to talk a little bit about if he had taken this set of data, what would have his next step been? So Joseph, it's all you. Joseph, you need to unmute. There we go. Can people hear me? Yep. Um, maybe would it be better if I um, shared my screen and I can do it on my... Yeah, wait a minute. Let me make you co-host. Well, while you're doing that, um, I owe an immense debt of gratitude to Chris for <laughs> this project. He's put untold hours into it and makes life easier. Also, I see Martin Schleski's here. Hello. He um, did the first... He was the first to measure instruments this way with kind of a rotational with a microphone and I visited him and got inspired. Um, and um, so this is all sort of development of that initial idea. 
as well as some of those um, that um, George Bissinger, who, who, who sort of had a much more um, sophisticated rig. Um, at any rate, and um, George Stepani started all this with his software and um, we've sort of developed some of those things. Can, can I share now? Yes. Okay. So Martin, it's all your fault. Is that what I'm understanding? Yep. <laughs> One of his lesser crimes. <laughs> okay. Um, so can, can everyone see my screen? Yep. Ah, how'd you get the... Okay. How'd you get the um, Zoom panel out of the top? Does anyone know? It's one of the drop down options, but I just usually sort of blindly click. <laughs> Optimize, leave, huh? Oh, well, um, we can, this should work well enough for now. Um, so this is that same data, I believe, um, as measured. So, okay, that's what George was showing. You can click here and it'll, um, and we can increase this number if we wanna make it, um, let's say 32. Um, okay, so you can sort of optimize it for your screen. Let me go through a few things. Um, first of all, I, the first thing I asked Chris when he showed me this was where was it taken? Because there's a lot of fuzziness. And he said in some corner somewhere about the worst place you could take it. So. Um, the question is with a, a, a non-ideal measurement spaces is how to sort all this noise from the um, useful parts. And at least visually, the best way is just to smooth it a bit. You can see, um, you can gradually, um, now this isn't adding any more information or interpreting it, but it, it just makes it easier to look at. So what we expect to see is an A0. Now, um, the relative values we should be skeptical of if it's quite close to a wall, um, but let's just see what we can make of it. A0 um, is typically around 275, okay, 278. It doesn't vary that much. Um, now B1 minus here is probably being broken either by a room mode or and or um, a tailpiece resonance or a, um, uh, a fingerboard resonance, or else it's just up here high, which is quite plausible. It's 472, that's on the high side. But then again, B1 plus is on the high side, 571, they're usually about 100 hertz apart. Um, so this is a instrument whose stiffness to mass ratios are on the high side. Um, the, um, I should just say the, the range, um, well, let's, let's, let me show you the interpret. This is something Chris has been working on recently, which shows the same thing using um, our the nomenclature we use at Oberlin and elsewhere. You can see that um, the B1 range, and this is from, from my data, tends to be anywhere from um, 473 to 593. 593 is the highest I've seen. That would be the Vuitton, the original, and I don't know what the lowest is. Um, so those, both of these are on the high side. The transition hill appears unusually large here, and there's a, there's a very vigorous um, bridge hill reason, region. So, um, what I would like to do now, this isn't taken by me and it isn't in my workshop. So um, I have violins that I've measured that happen to work well for one reason or the other. So um, let me just clear everything. Um, the reason I like lists so much is if you have a lot of different um, collections of data, it's really hard to pull them together all the time. Um, so what I tend to do is get useful combinations of them and. Um, make a list and it's dead easy using this. Um, for example, this will pull up, um, these are averages of a, a set of 120 violins. I did the vertical, horizontal, and, um, and the average of the two. So let's see how, um, now Chris's measurement was a horizontal one. And unfortunately I've just, lost his file, so let me see if I can still get it. Oh, yes, here it is. No. Um, let's 
So here we have two sets of data taken at different levels. So we ignore completely the levels and instead of showing them as measured, we go to normalize. What does normalize do? It takes basically the average at each single frequency, um, or it takes a level at each single frequency um, and averages them all. So you'd get a, a straight line, you'd have the equivalent of, um, um, where's that flat? Yeah, you see both of these are the same normal level if I, as measured, wildly different levels. So um, normalizing has been used a lot um, in famous papers, um, papers like Dunwald's, where he was trying to um, find quality parameters by comparing the relative shapes of the um, spectra and ignoring the um, differences in, in overall levels. Um, is, that a, is that a good strategy? That's another question. But it, it does highlight the shapes. And it's a great way of comparing instruments and to just see that, you know, the spectral balance. Um, so um, what we see is if, if this, the black line is, is sort of an average of many old and new instruments, we see that this instrument has quite high B1 modes, relatively low A0, a, a lot here. Um, and, but otherwise the, the Bridge Hills follows. Um, um, so, I like using band averages because they make it very easy to see um, relative levels. Um, I've, the basic one I use um, is based off of um, these averages. In other words, there's a, there, in most violins, there tends to be a dip around here, a dip around here, a dip around here, uh, and, and, and so on. And so those are kind of natural ways of putting it. Um, um, so they're not particularly psychoacoustically based the way others are. Um, I also compiled um, band averages, for example, um, dune bolts. And I, I can, we could, uh, Chris, we should install these in the app too, because they're useful if you're reading his experiment. So many people refer to it, then you can see how um, the violin rates on a, on a dune vault, through a dune vault perspective. Or there's the bark scale. Um, I don't remember who developed that. Was it, was it Morehouse or prior to that? Which which really looks at the um, levels at which the ear discriminates. Um, I can't explain it well. I'm sure um, a lot of other people here who could. Um, anyway, these are all different ways of looking at data. And depending on what you're trying to do, um, it, it's great to be able to just pick them up quickly. So um, let's go back to this one. Yeah, I um, let me take it, pull up a different list. Oh, wh one of the great features about this app is that you can turn things on and off really easily. For example, it works really by having these lists are, these instruments are loaded and ready to look at. You can see all of them. You can see none of them. You can clear them all. Um, and then you can undo anything if you make a mistake. Now, um, uh, and then reduce, let's say you want to get rid of everything except one particular instrument. You just click that one particular instrument and reduce will take it down to that. Now I'm going to load another list. Um, and again, it's some of my reference instruments. Um, oh, yeah, another, another um, band I like is just got, um, it just basically, um, Yeah, basically, we have kind of the monopole region and then the, um, the treble region. It, it's a nice way of seeing how instruments compare um, in those two. You can see there's quite dramatic differences here. 
where things are quite close here. But if you normalize it, things, it tends to happen that way anyway. But that's just another tool that this is really good, good at. Um, um, okay, let's look at search. Um, yeah, search is marvelous. First, you specify what kind of a file you want, whether it's horizontal or vertical or some other um, class that you can make up. And then what type is an average, a complex average, or a real average, or a TRF? That's I think George's format for the um, um, you know the raw data. This is, would be a, a WAV file or or anything. And then you can put in um, um, a, a keyword, whatever. I'll put in Strad, and then it'll start put, pulling up anything that that has that name um, in your in your database. Um, and it'll tell you how many files. Um, the other way of um, getting at things, and this means that all your data can be kept in one big folder. Um, if you can't do that, then it, I would sort of keep making copies of folders with different selections in it. But this enables it all to be in one folder. And then by using the lists, you can, it's a compact way of bringing up any selection. You can also export a list really quickly, make a copy of the files within it and send it to a friend. So that makes it easy to, to share data. Um, um, the other way of, of searching is to browse, which is a much more conventional, it'll take you into your, your folder structure and you can um, um, go, from, go from there. Um, okay, well, I hadn't really prepared anything, so that's, um, um, I, I'll turn it back to Chris and questions. Well, let me show a few other things, colors. Um, you can save your um, the kind of colors you like to have. I found these work well for me for making the best contrast between a small number. Um, um, I have another one where it's for, for much larger numbers, for much larger sets. You can name color lists. It's, it's, it's useful when you're coming to making presentations. Um, you can also go on the screen and you can um, copy the image to clipboard, which is super useful. Um, you can auto scale, um, you can save it in a format Jim Woodhouse could use, for example, all sorts of things. Um, anything else that I should mention? Oh, yeah, for um, this is a, a screen for editing bands. You can type in the numbers to create new bands or you can um, add them, it'll put one, you can drag it around. And then you can save it as a as a new as a new band. So it, it makes it really easy if you just want to try any old um, idea you have about what might be important. You can make a, a set of bands that'll that'll identify it and and then equally well delete it. Um, and there's a very nice feature here, um, which is super if you're if you're kind of uh, trying to write up a paper and um, this will form an X. Uh, uh, Excel file, which has basically all of your band levels, the frequencies, um, and the um, amplitudes. Um, so you can get that data into a, a form and start, you know, averaging that or, or doing whatever you're trying to do. Um, good. I will um, stop sharing, and I'll be on hand if, if people have, have questions. Thanks. So that's basically it. Um, You've got you've you've got the link. I can put the link in the chat again. Uh, if people want to play, it, I'm happy to help. Um, our our long term goal again is to try and see if we can't collect and share data so that we can really start looking at the stuff across many instruments, which I think would be really neat. So, so thank thanks a lot for coming, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. So if you have a question, uh, please use the uh, raise hand feature. All right. Um, Hey, Suze. Uh, thank you, Fan. Uh, thank you, Chris, Joseph, Lydia, for, for your work. I have the same question that uh, Anders wrote in the chat. Uh, I have the problem that I cannot use the software through a national instrument sound card because I need to, to take energy from ICP yep. this one without any button. So you, 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 you know that 
is a possibility to to fix or to include some some tools for this topic thank you yes. uh yeah claudia has been asking me for that too sorry claudia i've been slow um but uh i have the drivers i because we actually use those too i just they're only um pc based and so i need to figure out how to make it so that all my automated compiling stuff works differently for the pc side for then for the mac side uh it's very straightforward so uh, i'll make it happen this summer and and you just signed up to be a beta tester congratulations <laughs> okay thank you chris any other questions Andrew. Hi, right, so I, I think my question maybe is related to Jesus. So I just wanted to clarify, you mentioned that the, the Obi app, which is really amazing, by the way, it, it looks like you put a tremendous amount of work into it. Um, you mentioned it was written in the LabVIEW language, but it interfaces with a sound card. So if I'm actually running LabVIEW in the National Instrument System, I have a sound, I mean, I have an anechoic chamber with actual microphone positioning system. So I'd like to integrate this into my existing National Instrument System. So can I just use it as like a VI within that or can, can that be integrated? So this is great. I didn't expect anybody to actually have even heard of LabVIEW. Um, so uh, so there is there are three different versions you can pull off the, the cloud, the, the, the Google site. Um, there's a LabVIEW one, a PC one, and a Mac one. So if you just pull the LabVIEW one, you got all the code. Um, what I can do on, I can certainly, that's an interesting point. I can certainly make the LabVIEW one support LabVIEW hardware uh, pretty easily. So maybe that's the solution. So if you have LabVIEW hardware, you need to have LabVIEW. I mean, if you have NI hardware, you need to have LabVIEW. And that, that, might, that actually might work really well. I hadn't thought of that. And then I, I could have more than two ports, perhaps, because you know, I would have a microphone and, and maybe some other sensors. Yeah, yeah. One of, the, one of the ones we want to do this summer is to have nine microphones simultaneously with the HIT. Uh, so we've got a LabVIEW. I mean, an NI stack of, uh, of whatever they are, so you know, the C series stuff to do that. Okay, thanks, Chris. But but we need to to have a, a license a license for for LabVIEW because oh. in, in in my case I need a, to 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 write a, a code in C because I, I don't have LabVIEW. Oh. So uh, NI just came out with a free version of LabVIEW, the community version of LabVIEW. I will make sure to see, I'll check and see if it can run the C series modules. Otherwise, Jesus will figure something out uh, for years as well. Okay, thank you. All right, Jim. Hi, everyone. This, this is an area, it's a great talk, great, great software. This is a completely irrelevant comment that I just struck me while watching your video at the beginning. Um, I see that we've got Dennis Braun on the um, on the list of participants here. I wonder whether people are. I wonder whether he remembers that he's the person who invented the idea of damping strings by weaving a business card through them. We saw that in the first video. Um, he's uh, that, that, that's one of his great contributions to science. While working in David Rubio's uh, workshop many years ago now, David Rubio is the one who invented tea leaves for Cladney patterns compared with Carleen Hutchins's Christmas glitter, which is too heavy. Tea leaves are lighter. So everyone contributes something. Sorry about that. That was just a silly comment. Oh, that was very comment. interesting. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> are there any other questions? Um, so what I suggest is, um, wait a minute. First, let me stop. Oh, Colin. Go ahead. Unmute yourself. I I, I was fiddling um, to, to see go. in the reactions what 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 how to do things. However, may, may I make a comment? It's not a question. Um, I've been testing out um, the software as well um, for simpler measurements, and I think this is what for makers this is important. Because, for example, you can use it equally well for something like admittance measurements or the internal sound measurements that I make, um, which doesn't involve any of the averaging of, of, of um, the sound fields. And I just want to emphasize that you know, it's a universal 
type um, software that can be used for a great variety of things, including the simple things that people might want to do in a workshop. That's all. Let me let me just add um, or remark about one thing. One thing that the software doesn't do much now is show phase, and, and a lot of physicists, um, first being Gabi, I know, would always say, "So where's the phase?" Um, we, I, um, Chris, does it do it? Do we have it in in in, in one of the pop up windows? Yeah, it's it's in the fun area. There's a there are a couple of things that are kind of useful in the fun area. One of them is is the ability to see phase. Another one is the ability to see the individual taps and compare the individual taps. Oh, and you can go into the the three D the Nyquist view too, which shows yeah, things right. in a different way, which is absolutely so, worth showing. And I'm I might say all these things are available, of course, in George's soft uh, um, uh, software, but it, they are very valuable because one one of the things is to look at the real and imaginary parts of things like the admittance or whatever you're looking at, because that gives you a lot of information about the actual modes that you're looking at, that you wouldn't get otherwise. So it gives you extra information rather than plotting everything on a decibel scale. If you put it on a linear scale, and then it's depend the, the results are dependent on the phase. Um, so so the, um, if you plot the real and imaginary part separately as a function of frequency, you get a lot of extra information that you don't get when you plot it on a dB scale, which I find very useful in trying to understand what's happening. Jim? Uh, can, I, uh, can I give a quick follow-up question on phase just because um, um, in the course of that comment, you mentioned Garby, and he was very keen on mentioning phase. Um, just this is this is a thing for Chris, in case it hasn't been passed on to you. Gabby had a cunning trick for showing phase on a magnitude plot, because phase is intrinsically circular, and you can use the circular nature of the color wheel to color your magnitude according to the phase in a way that just goes round the circle. Hmm. It, it's, he wrote it up somewhere. It's just a, yes. a, a typical Gabby really neat trick, which is obvious once you saw it. it, it it's, since you're into providing options, it's worth, worth a go. Great idea. Yeah, I'd, I'd be psyched to, uh, psyched to incorporate if you can send me a link. Yeah, I'll see if I can remember. It, it's mel 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 Melody, um, uh, what's the other person? It's a three name thing. And it's, uh, it's on the Le, Le, Le Gruyere violin, which was the violin with holes around the wrist. That's right, the Swiss that, cheese. Um, violin, George yeah. Bissinger. And it's related to the Shaw model um, uh, for uh, describing the A0 and the A1 air resonances. But it's, a, that's an, it's an interesting paper. All right, uh, back to Jesus. Thank you. I have a question for Joseph. Uh, Joseph, uh, you, you put a, a mark beyond the rich hill in, in your presentation, Joseph, and you wrote vertical excitation. Uh, can you speak more about this? Um, um. In, 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 when you're talking of the frequency response, you have marks in, in the signature modes, the transition hill, rich hill, and then you wrote. Uh, oh, in the upper hill. Upper hill, um, and vertical excitation in parentheses. Uh, what is this upper well, hill? Well, the, 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 the standard way of, of, of measuring a violin is to tap the bridge sideways. So with, um, in parallel with the plane of the top, um, of course, the bow um, exerts forces in, I mean, the bow moves almost 90 degrees going from the bottom string to the top. So clearly there's vertical forces involved. I started measuring those routinely some years back and found that um, one of the, um, to me, surprising differences was it was quite a large um, hill, rather like the bridge hill, but Sp space between about four kilohertz and um, seven kilohertz. And one of the first old instruments I measured um, was um, 
using that was a, the Buton Guarneri, and that had a, an amazingly strong vertical bridge hill at which, and not that, not that high uh, um, a normal bridge hill. So it had quite a different sound and quite a different um, spectral balance. And so I became very interested in that and, and, and found that's generally true that the vertical tap will produce as much sound overall, but it's very much um, focused towards or balanced towards the high end. And when you're listening to a, a violin, I was just testing a violin this morning, um, one of mine, and I was, the, the, the bridge, it, it sounded good to me. I mean, there's a, a good amount of, um, of treble and a good amount of um, articulation, but the bridge hill measured horizontally was not especially impressive. Then I looked at the measured vertically and got the, the upper hill and it was, it was quite strong. And so, um, and when you, when you regraduate an instrument, you see the energy tends to move down from that upper hill to the bridge hill and the bass goes up, there's sort of this flow. Um, so for example, looking at the, the, the violin that um, Chris, Chris measured with rather high B1 modes, um, he just measured it horizontally, um, but um, if you were to thin it out and um, the, the B1 modes would go down, the A0 would go up, the bridge hill would tend to go up and the upper hill would go down. So those are the things that I keep track of because I think they are um, very audible and, and very important to the, um, um, the sound of the instrument. But um, Martin, um, you, have you been measuring vertically as well? You, you do all sorts of things. Again? Have, have you been doing vertical measurements as well? What have you found? No, I do mainly the main bowing direction, X direction, like, like okay. you do. Okay. Yeah. So does that answer your question, Jesus? Mm, yes. Well, well, vertical excitation is hitting in this direction, right? Yes, hitting the top of the bridge at its highest point. So somewhere um, between the A and D strings, a little closer to the D string usually. Um, Downwards. Downwards. Horizontal excitation is this way? Yes. Oh, okay. No, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, one thing we should uh, point out is that the, the actual excitation of the strings is at the string notches. And so the, the transfer function from where you're hitting it from the bridge, either in the horizontal at the edge of the bridge or vertically on the top of the bridge, does not correspond exactly to the, um, you know, the transfer function at where the string notches are. Um, but of course, it's very difficult to figure out how to hit it at the string notches. But the, um, but the presumably the horizontal and vertical excitations that Joseph is doing gives us some indication. Um, of what the transfer function might actually be at the string notches. Um, but yeah. Uh, well, another way of putting it, to my mind, we want to hit, we want to excite all radiant modes of the violin that can be excited by the bridge. And to the extent that in plane motion of the bridge excites those modes rather than moving front to back, which isn't well coupled. So it, it, to the extent that in plane motion of the bridge in any direction is exciting um, radiant modes, then any two normal directions should work. For example, you could go at two directions down at the top at 45 degrees, um, you, um, and then you could specify quite precisely the, um, the um, excitation point. When we measure horizontally, we're assuming that the top of the bridge is rigid and that the force is going straight through, um, and similarly, with vertical, so the actual um, um, nominal measure point is, is somewhere in the center of the bridge. But trying to actually translate them into what an individual string is doing would take um, quite a bit of work. And I think some of, uh, Jim, some of your pupils have worked on that, haven't they? With cellos and rotational. Yeah, yeah. No, my, my student Eileen um, did a project on that. That's written up somewhere. Yeah, cellos are easier. There's more room to move on a cello bridge. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we have a question from Robert. Yeah, I'm wondering if anyone has experience with do-it-yourself impulse hammers for people that don't want to spend a thousand bucks on <laughs> uh, on PCB piezotronics and and their their electronics. 
Tom, I'm giving that one over to you. <laughs> yeah, there is uh, some work going on about building a hammer and, and making hammers that are more cost effective. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, there's pretty good progress with that project. Hopefully, uh, there'll be something to show within the next month or so, uh, an update on that. But it's coming along. Can I can I comment too? I mean, it, it's it's very easy to build a, an impact hammer that costs only a few dollars. In fact, um, by by using um, a microphone, except uh, essentially as an accelerometer, mm -hmm. and you very cheap microphones, electric microphones, which cost less than a cup of coffee, you can turn those into accelerometers. And so you can easily make a hammer that, that, that actually on, on, only costs, well, I'd say less than a cup of coffee. Oh, um, so so there's, no, there's no need. But of course, it, the, the one thing that I, I should say is, is that, of course, it's not calibrated in the same sort of way. Um, but I've got some ideas about how you calibrate them at any rate. And um, um, uh, the future is bright, I think, because lots of people now, like Tom, uh, are actually thinking about the ways in which to make very inexpensive equipment, basically, to be able to do measurements cheaply in, in, in the workshop. All right, um, George? I'd like to point out nowadays, oh. there's a lot of things that cost less than a cup of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Time does not. <laughs> George? I've got two things now to say. I'll just follow you on from Colin. I mean, and, uh, obviously, one of the things that's well known in hammers and accelerometers is the ballistic pendulum calibration, which is extremely effective and accurate if you do it carefully. But another thing you can do is you can actually uh, calibrate uh, transfer functions. So if you have a known mass, it's a single degree of freedom system. So you can say the transfer function should be flat all the way through its frequency. And you know the value because it's the inverse of the mass. So you can actually using a mass, you can use a, um, a, a transfer function as a calibration factor, which takes into account uh, um, core response in different frequency regions. But, but the thing I raised my hand on was um, this matter about um, the, the horizontal and vertical tap. So Claudia knows a lot about this because her PhD student, uh, Timothy Wofford, uh, kind of noted that, the, uh, that these are complex functions. And so for any pair, for any particular microphone position, a horizontal tap and a vertical tap, or as Joseph says, any pair of taps at 90 degrees, somewhere there's a, 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 an angle which gives you a maximum uh, of course, that pair of transfer functions, depending on the phase um, and at any given frequency. And then th there's also a minimum at 90 degrees. So in fact, when, when we look at either a horizontal or a vertical tap, we're only looking at part of the information about um, the radiation of that instrument. So we really need to look that, it, that it's in, within a range of a maximum and minimum for any particular microphone position. Uh, and that's something is quite complicated to think about, but um, I think we, we, a bit by bit we'll work on that a, a, a somewhat more. And I think I don't know if Claudia wants to mention it, but we were looking at the Bill Bell data. We actually found a stronger correlation between uh, the people's um, comments of, of listeners. They correlated better with the minimum um, uh, of the, you know, of a likely excitation angle that correlated better than the maximum which is uh, it's curious we there's, there's a bit, bit of work to be done on this area but i have uh, for anyone who's interested in my, my uh, frf overlay has now incorporated the sort of algebra thanks to jim where, where you can come up with the um the right information so it will show you for any any frequency bin for a pair, a horizontal and vertical pair, it'll show you not only the maximum and minimum, but it'll show you that relative angles that that takes place at. Maximum and minimum always being 90 degrees apart. So one, one of the things Timothy also noted uh, working on tellers is that the uh, Boeing, in, uh, the 
um, force polarization of the string is not always the same as the bowing inclination. So the, the, the uh, force polarization tends to drift more towards the horizontal than, towards, than vertical. So it's a little bit of a new area. I don't know if Claudia wants to mention it at all, but I just thought I'd, I'd bring that uh, up. Uh, George, can, can, you, can you clarify I'm that? Working on it. George, can you clarify that last statement about the uh, the force function of not exact? Oh, right. right. You... So when, when, uh, uh, as, as a kind of first uh, expectation, if you, if you drag your bow across the string, you expect the string to vibrate on the on the same plane that the bow, bow hair is moving, but actually it doesn't. It can it can deviate from that by uh, as much as forty degrees. Oh yeah. The, okay. Uh, no, I, I yes, that's and, absolutely know, when, true. When people are, they so this means that if, the, if you need to think. Go ahead, Claudia. Yeah, you say. It, so this it, means it, that even if, this means that even if you think that you are bowing horizontally, you can the vibration of the string can actually have a vertical component, so that will still excite the bridge vertically, even if you are actually bowing horizontally. Yes, I, I I can confirm that. I mean, many years ago, I haven't done it recently, but that um, but there is a vertical component to the string vibration, um, and it seems to be um, also dependent on the um, the presumably the elasticity of the string, but, and, but specifically the core, because it seems like um, synthetic core strings have a much larger vertical component than steel core strings. Um, yeah, but what we found it surprising is that for a given note, depending on where this note was played, so depending on you yeah. know, the first note and the after note, the polarization of the string is not the same. But not the same. So it depends on other factors as well. Yeah, you cannot predict oh, okay. it. Okay, very interesting. Yeah, okay. I, 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 would, I, would, I would assume that the, I mean, at any given, um, a, a, a given bridge notch, um, Every mode will have a, a particular direction, and one may be vertical, one may be, it could be anywhere in between. And so you've got a summation of modes moving. And I, I think of it as um, you can look at the, the bow as the direction the wind is blowing. A sailboat could be moving at, it can never be moving the opposite way, but it can be, you know, cutting across in different ways. And it, 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 that's the image that kind of makes sense for me. How could it possibly be doing a different direction than, than the bow? No, this um, I, I no, this has to do with the fact that the, um, the 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 string has elasticity, and if you, for example, so so the um, the the vibration in a very simple model is completely you know transverse, side to side, with no vertical motion. Yeah, well. But in in practice, it turns out that there is a vertical component to the string vibration. So I've heard uh, of a violinist, a strange guy who's not with us anymore, who seems to say that uh, if you're playing a violin properly, the string should spin. So I think he meant that it was kind of that it was something like that, but it's not simply on one plane. Well, yeah, the spin, yeah, if it if it's spinning around it, it it implies that there is both vertical and horizontal motion. Can a player do something about it? Can they in some way that how they manage their bow stroke? Can they make the string go to a the stronger polarized angle or can they make it go the other way if they want to appear this well well, this know, is, but, but so, well i think this is data. yeah this is a area very, that's that's um you know very little studied all i know is that it exists and it seems like claudia has already um uncovered a bit more information but there's this is just a tiny tip of the iceberg um, in this area so um Oh, can, yeah. can, can can Jim make a comment here sure. because Jim's worked on on this? Sure, go ahead. Can I share the screen so Jim, I can? Jim that? Jim Woodhouse, yeah, Jim. But Claudia wants to share her screen as well. So. Yeah, no, let Claudia go ahead. Oh, right, and then we can have Jim. Oh, yeah, let's see. And you see the plot? Yep. So this is basic. So this is a bow inclination angle. So it's zero if it's horizontal. It's minus 40 if it's, uh, 
I think the C string and plus 40 if mm -hmm. it's A string. And here it's the fourth polarization angle. So how the, the string is actually vibrating. And all the dots, all the colors correspond to different notes played on each of the string. So all the blue dots would be, I don't know, like for example, the, the A played on the A string, for example, and then all the purple could be the A sharp played on the A string. And so we can see that if the, the bowing polarity, the polarization of the string was the same as the bowing condition angle, the dots will all lie on the black line. And you can actually see that they deviate quite a lot. So for a bowing uh, inclination, of being kind of flat on the middle strings, you can see that the polarization can actually be at 40 or 50 degrees. So the component of the vertical, the vertical component of the string vibration can be pretty large. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, that... I think I found it quite difficult to get my head round at first. I thought, what, what are they talking about? But after a while I got, the idea of, understood it basically from a mathematical point of view, but the actual physical reality of it is intriguing, isn't it? And, and like, is it some something to do with in, initial conditions when you start start that note? Uh, we don't know, but there's, there's something of interest here, I think. Yeah, I mean, I was volunteered to say something, but I don't have anything very coherent to say on this, except this is complicated. <laughs> I think there, there are several different things going on here. Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, if the string is moving with the component perpendicular to the bow hair, then the bow hair, of course, is vibrating with it. Or conversely, you may be driving that vertical motion with, with a, a vigorous bow stroke where you drop the bow on the string. Of course, you're, yeah. you're exciting some vertical motion, Absolutely. but it may be a different type of motion than the stick slip motion. The friction force that's driving the regular Helmholtz motion is acting in the plane of the bow hair. So um, exactly what this plot of Claudius means needs more work and more unpacking because... Um, it doesn't, there isn't a single well-defined angle at which the string is doing the things that the textbooks say. Um, this is saying there is force being applied in both directions and it may be important, but it's probably a different kind of thing going on in the two directions. Things like the bow hair resonances may be manifesting in the, in the perpendicular direction. So now this is a complicated thing. Yes, it needs more work. It's a very fiddly experiment to do. There's a reason why they did this on the cello, and it's still rather fiddly to do. Having a force sensor that um, measures both of these things without any crosstalk and all of that is, is quite fiddly. Yeah, uh, so the bow inclination was measured with motion capture. So we had markers on the bow and with cameras. So we were able to measure the bow inclination angle compared to the cello, and the bridge force polarization was obtained from the piezo sensors on the bridge. So yeah, we... well, I think, I think I gave you the kit for making that, but it is fiddly to keep those two channel force sensors working reliably, because they tend to have crosstalk, which would manifest as an angle error as well. So it's, um, it's my How experience. How we did the calibration like what you did with Aileen? I think we did it properly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's um yeah uh, uh, yeah absolutely. Anyone looking for a new PhD project, there there'd be something in this area, but it needs to be thought about carefully before tossing a student into it because it's it's quite difficult. There is some literature out there on this, and there are some videos of the of of, of um, high speed videos of the looking down the bow and seeing the the the, the bow hair being made to vibrate by the string bouncing in the vertical direction. Um, they've been around for a, quite a long time now, but really, really tight measurements, and certainly measurements on the violin rather than the cello are thin on the ground. I think a, a really important takeaway of this is we, we always must remember that measuring, you know, the, the, the concept of a violin's radiativity is, is a very slippery one. 
uh, and, and in, a, in a sense, there is no perfect way of doing it. I mean, the, uh, a better model is perhaps a kind of spherical array of microphones in an anarchic chamber. But, you know, it's not practical. So I think what we have to, set, what we have to realize is that when we do these measurements, we're, we're taking some kind of a snapshot. And the most important thing is that everybody does it the same way, whether for good or better or worse. It may not be the optimum method of measuring radiation, but if we do it in a very similar way, then the measurements become more comparable. And the best measurement sets are where you can take a group of violins, same operator, measures them in the same room with exactly the same setup at the same time. And, um, you know, it's not something, it's not an exact science at the moment, and it requires a little bit of tolerance and understanding of how it's working. Okay, so um, I, mean, I thought we will say it's yeah, George, I, difficult to interpret. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a great summary for of this and also Jim's summary of, of this subject. And um, I don't think we're going to solve it right now. And Dimitri has been patiently waiting. So let's go to Dimitri. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great talk. Well, my question is, I don't have an impact hammer yet. And my measurement rig looks like that. So just a hand driven wooden hammer which when I let it go from the same position gives me surprisingly repeatable measurements and at least gives me some idea about uh, the height of my modes. So, uh, and I'm using Spectra Plus software right now, reading my sound with the recorder. And I tried to play with OB app a bit and I couldn't find out if I can use it without the signal input from the hammer. Can I do it just like Spectra Lab, Spectra Plus? So just with microphone input. Yes, there's a mode you can you can choose an input device called tap tones, uh -huh. uh, and then it will trigger off of any any sound above your threshold level. So if you're quiet, it won't do anything until you actually do the hit, and then it it'll pick it up fine. Great, thank you but, very much. But I would I would highly recommend Colin's little uh, um, microphone dealy because if you it costs. <laughs> Costs less than a cup of coffee, but <laughs> it's cheap, and you can throw it on your hammer, and that is a great trigger uh, to, to to get a measurement. Well, I, I don't quite understand how it will work better and and why. I I, I have a small pick, uh, I, a small feel on piezo pickup, but uh, why uh, the microphone and the hammer will be better than actual wooden hammer and reading the information with the recorder. Can I answer that one? Um, because there, there's a technical answer to that. Um, it depends what you want your data for. And that's a really important thing that runs through the whole of this discussion. If you're doing it for your workshop and comparing what you do on one day to what you did two years ago, what you're doing is absolutely fine. If you want to swap data with someone else, then it's not so fine. Because even if they have a thing that looks a bit like yours, it won't be exactly the same. The virtue of the hammer, which measures the actual force that goes in, is that it allows you to remove the effect of the hammer and produce a version of the measurement which is kind of compensated so that any hammer, provided it's gone through the software and been compensated, will give the same answer. So for your internal consistency measurements, what you're doing is perfect. If you want to swap files with someone else and compare with someone else using a different rig that's when the, the force measuring hammer will come into its own okay yeah thank you jim um Thanks. uh chris the, the uh, mj had a question about um how many channels does your software support more than two so so the first two channels are free the second two channels require <laughs> no um <laughs> <laughs> the uh, it, the problem is in the octa capture. Uh, I don't seem to be able to do more than two channels at a time. Um, I've been playing around with a couple other sound cards that that look like they might allow that. The uh, the National Instruments C series modules definitely allow that. Uh, it's it's more a it's a bandwidth on the USB connection, I believe, in terms of how much they can shove through, how many tracks they can shove through at the same time. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, we certainly yeah, I think that's hardware, it's as many as you want. If we go with uh, something other than the OctaCapture, I think we can get uh, more than two. So the the short answer yeah. is that your your software supports multiple many channels. 
but there could be limitations with the hardware that you actually use. Yes, a lot of the stuff we've done at this point is made it really designed around the two channels. So I don't know, but yes, it should be able to acquire more. Okay, thank you. I, I did. A, I, a, I, a, I wrote a version of my software that could manage multiple channels, but it got very complicated in in the, the interface, and I stopped doing it. But it, there's, I don't think there's a problem, right? You can use multi-channel sound cards with exactly. software like um, exactly. Cubase and that kind of thing. People record several, you know, 16 channels at the same time. I mean, and a USB E3 can, can handle that, no problem. You take, take, take the example of the Large Hadron Collider, which it takes as much telephone communication as the whole world. Um, uh, is going um, so uh, multi multi channel an analyzing with the right m software is straightforward, but I mean, no one's developed it cheaply for violin, violin makers yet. Uh, I think, as far as, as far as cheap multi channel things, I haven't bought one yet, but I've been looking at some of these uh, new digital uh, mixing boards. And I've seen for under a thousand dollars up to twelve channels recorded onto a uh, onto a hard drive, essentially. Yeah. So yeah. there may be a path here. It's uh, something to explore, and there's some hardware out there we may be able to borrow from the audio folks. Mm -hmm. Well, one can certainly um, um, one could do it not in real time. I mean, you could use Audacity or something and record as yeah. many tracks as you like, and then go back into the analysis and start doing it. That, that's what, of course, they do on the Large Hadron Collider. Yeah. Uh, you record all the data. Yeah. And then analyze afterwards. But it could be, good, it could be done in, 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 a, in, a, in a fraction of a second with modern technology, I'm sure. You just, just in, uh, have eight channels being recorded separately for, for 0.3 of a second or whatever it might be, uh, and then put them into memory, then then spin them off a second later into a computer. Yeah, I, th I think the issue is in the sound card drivers, or it's in LabVIEW, I'm not sure. Okay, yeah. Uh, working with Facebook too. We did when, um, for Timothy Moffat, we, we used, we wanted, um, Three channels. We wanted a micro a hammer microphone and a, um, an acceler um, accelerometer. We just used two computers, split the split the hammer signal into two channels, and uh, had the, the two different transfer functions came up on two separate computers. If you're desperate, you can always do that. Or, or as has been pointed that's out, where the Raspberry Pi comes in. Yep, Chris. All right. Um... Are there any other questions? Seems like we're sort of out of questions, but we're, we're um, fairly early on. I, and I, I think there's probably some of us would probably enjoy continuing, I don't know, um, discussions about something or socializing. So um, here, here's what I'm going to do, okay? Um, I'm gonna create four breakout rooms if you want to go into your private room with a couple of people you can text those people and say meet me in one of the um four breakout rooms and uh let me see i'm going to open all, all the rooms and uh i think the are the are the rooms oh wait a minute 78 oh so uh Where do you see the rooms? Okay, I think I created them, but. You have, they're showing up. The, a new item pops up at the bottom of my screen. So join, break break, join a breakfast room, yeah. Yeah. Okay, if the you want to go in, you know, uh, to your own private breakout room. Um, meanwhile, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna keep this main room open. And um, I think we could just open the floor to any types of um, questions on any topic or discussions stories um people want to do doesn't even have to be about violin acoustics anybody want 
to start something. <laughs> that was really awkward, right? And it'd be on a glass of wine? No. <laughs> or a glass of wine? Jim, be with his glass of wine. I'm jealous. Oh, well, well actually, I'm, I'm going to start, you know, since, since Colin mentioned this, because, you know, Colin, you mentioned on the, the Large Hadron uh, Collider. It's, it's, it's my understanding that um, um, they actually cannot record everything. So they actually have real-time detectors to decide what to record. Okay, so those things are working in real time. So they have a huge amount of massive parallel processing working in real time. Um, is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So they're you're doing this, you know, sort of, they're basically doing what we're doing here, but on a billion times more massive, faster scale. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, Yeah. That. Okay. So, what are what are people finding out with their tests? What are what are people? What... Uh, you're, you're online. Right now. Oh, hello. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Sam. Right. So, just to bring it back into the real world, like, so there's been a lot of talk about testing, and I've been thinking about it myself, and I've been a dabbler for a long time. So, for those who have been doing testing for a while, what are some of the things you're finding, and how does that apply to your making as far as before and after, or comparing instruments? Well, Sam, I. I... Suggest why? Why don't you start? Since you've been doing a lot of this. Well, for example, <laughs> um, <laughs> we just had an extravaganza um, earlier this week where I had um, uh, I had three of my Titian models at one time, and then I had um, three of my Kreutzer models. They're both Strad models, so they're not radically different, and they all sound pretty good. So the question is, would you be able to see? Uh, category differences between these two models, which are not very different, but we feel that there is a perceived difference. So we tested all of them with Chris's software and with Joseph's rig, and um, it wasn't 100%, but there were actually sort of satisfying category differences. Um, and in this particular case, like what's the, the distinguishing feature of the Kreutzer is basically a higher fuller arch, um, and the Titian is uh, not as high and has more of a bullseye thicker back as opposed to the Kreutzers, which tend to have more uniform, thinner backs. Um, and what we found, if I, you can jump in if you remember differently, but there's the area that we-, we before, before you say it, maybe you could show the plot to us and then we, we can see whether we, we categorize into groups before you uh, say it. Well, it'll take a minute to get that set up. We could come back to it. MJ has to turn on her computer. Yeah, because then give me like know. three minutes. Although, where's your computer? Oh, it's on my computer. It's on your computer. Oh, yeah. I have to get my computer. Okay. Um, you uh, give us three minutes. We say it, then we will see it. But if you don't say it and we see it, you know, it's. Well, uh, talk among yourselves. I'll get my computer. <laughs> we'll yeah, can we come back? back? <laughs> Anybody else want to talk about what they. Who else uses? <laughs> Has anybody started using it or tried it out? Yeah. But I mean, it, it, it's. Colin, did you want to I mean, say? The, Go the, ahead. Is it uh, making measurements on instruments, um, and seeing what the effects are, for example, of the f holes, the uh, adding weight to the necks. Ch changing the sound post position, changing the bridge, and um, seeing what the physical changes that it were making, and then relating that to, to the perceptual changes, I think is very important. Particularly important in setting up, for example, if you're trying to change something, to see if you know, what you're doing it, 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 it is sensible and should carry on in that sort of way. I mean, it's up to individual makers, I think, to learn how to use the equipment in a way that actually helps them in, in optimizing whatever qualities of the instrument that, that they want to have. Obviously, um, measuring simple things like uh, mo mode frequencies, um, uh, uh, um, which differ from instruments to instruments, but nevertheless, in the, the major um, Cremonese makers, you find that, um, for example, the signature modes are roughly in the same place. Um, so uh, at least aiming at something like that is, it seems to me to be, uh, I'm not a maker, but I do make instruments on, on computers. Um, but, but I should think from a practical point of view, 
if you if your signature modes don't look like a, a, a decent Strad or Gennarius or whatever instrument you want, or a modern instrument of the same quality, that then then you know that something needs to be done, and, and be by doing experiments uh, and making measurements, you can see to what extent you're um, get, getting towards what you know what 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 is, is sensible. And it's particularly important, in fact, I think, in the setup, um, in in um, playing around with the bridge, for example, and seeing how that's actually changing the sound of the instrument. But I'm not a maker. I think makers like Martin, who's been doing Martin, if we can bring him in here, because he, um, he was a pioneer, in fact, of using measurements like the ones we've been talking about, in, in or, or order to make the instruments that he wants to yeah so so it's a perfect segue it, uh, martin are, are you still here martin yes yeah, yeah he's here. smiling yeah so do, do you uh, yes yeah, so, uh, i think um people we're very interested in your perspective on on how you use you know these measurements yeah so especially maybe. especially when you started out you know at the beginning yes it's 20 years time that i do just these measurements so with hundreds or thousands of instruments um, maybe the first comment I would really say it's very dangerous to make measurements <laughs> because it can be extremely misleading if you start not to trust what you hear and to you trust bad measurements. So it's absolutely essential, I would say, to spend a lot of money for really professional measurement equipment. So I'm very thankful for what you presented today, Joseph, and... Uh, with this software, but it's just the same with a hammer, with a microphone. Please do not use cheap equipment, I would say, because you will get bad results and you will destroy your your personal perception if if um, if it doesn't correlate to what you measure. So it's really necessary to do very good measurements, otherwise you will ruin your perception and your trust on your ears. So this is one thing. So I would say, please spend some money to get something really good and not make cheap solutions. Then it's better to just trust the years. Um, the measurements which Joseph does with the rig and um, with the impact hammer, I find them extremely helpful um, because they are very quickly done. Uh, I started doing modal analysis many years ago and I think it's not very helpful because it takes too long to do it. So for, for making instruments in the workshop, you need um, measurement um, methods which are fast enough so that you will do them every day. And then you learn a lot when you do them every day. And um, with those measurements, I find it extremely, as just as Joseph showed, extremely helpful to compare instruments concerning the energy ratio to see how strong is the A0 mode in absolute values compared to the transition hill and to the bridge hill. It's very helpful. And it's very helpful to see um, if there's too much energy in the transition hill, you will ruin the sound because um, the, you, the, the musician will never be able to, to modify uh, the sound because it's too vulgar if you have too lot uh, too much energy in this uh, region so you can just see what is the, the ratio of energy in each region and what you, then you can start modifying the sound post the bridge and everything in order to get this done what i do some more um, evaluation on the results what i find very helpful is to do an analysis when you get the averaged frequency response function of the instrument, what you showed, Joseph, then to I calculate in the Excel sheet, which is a very big sheet, um, the, um, the the distribution on how much energy does every harmonic get when you bow all the sixty tones, and then you can make a distribution and say, well, this instrument radi radiates. 70, let's say 37% on the first harmonic, only 8% on the second harmonic, but 15% on the third harmonic. And so, and then you can say, this is a problem instrument. Um, for example, if you have too much energy in the transition hill, the third harmonic will be very dominant. 
So you can, I find it very helpful to make a colored map. And this is the first thing I do with every instrument. I, I, I look on the harmonic structure of the instrument. So not on the resonance profile, um, on the transfer function. This is only a physical function. But to translate the physical function into a musically relevant function means to show every tone that you can play, which is 60 tones I, I show on the X axis, and then show the ratio on how, uh, what is the percentage of radiation for every harmonic. And then you very quickly see how many problem tones the instrument will have. So if the player says, well, the F sharp is really, I, I don't like this tone. And this tone is much too weak on the first on the end on the second harmonic, the third and fourth are very strong. And then this helps a lot to, to, to just to, to get a plot of the tonal color of the instrument. And the other thing which is helpful is um, just the absolute radiation values to say this is not a powerful instrument. This is, and this is a very powerful instrument. So these are the two things I do, tonal color and the tonal output, the projection and, and power of the instrument. Because it's actually all my clients, I may, well, maybe only 10% of my clients do not like power. So if they are honest, 90% love powerful instruments. And so you can, you can just, and the reason is that the powerful instrument sounds very beautiful in piano. It, it's not playing loud, this is not the point, but if you have, instrument with very strong resonances, it will sound extremely beautiful playing it in piano. And, and so my clients love power. And so I can make measurements and, and I, I can very quickly see if I have a reason to be disappointed with an instrument that I made, or if I can be happy with an instrument I made. So that would, well, you could talk tower, uh, many hours about what, how much it helps, but it's really a measurement method that helps a lot and which is helpful to uh, like a compass to say well that's good and that's somehow a problem and martin would you say that let's say you make an instrument no one's played it yet you see the measurement would you have a pretty good guess from the measurement whether it's 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 a really good instrument was going to sell to a really good player or not but I, I have a feeling that if i see the measurement and it's a really good one, whatever that means, I mean by my values, I'm surprised if it gets a different reaction from players or, um, but what, what, what you said at the beginning is, is fascinating, this, the psychological component, do you depend on measuring and do you, um, can you, um, can your ear deteriorate from relying on it too much? And it's a very interesting subject that I haven't heard discussed before. Um, I was reading an article about the, 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 the feelings of people who've had artificial things implanted in their body for to prevent um, seizures, for example, and it changes their identity. And when those are removed, they have this sense of loss. I think that the tools we use become an intimate part of our psychology. And I certainly feel when my rig is down, which it has been like last week, I'm, I feel restless and I, I you know, yes. it, it's like someone's covering one eye. Um, is is that bad or is it good? Well, I would rather I would rather suffer that loss than not have the insight it gives me. And Absolutely. I also agree. I don't like to stress it, but I do think it is important to get good equipment. I do think it's important that we can try and bring the price down. And things like Tom is doing is fantastic, and, and Chris with the software because it really was so expensive before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, but anyway, it's nice to hear your thoughts on this. Yes, it's, it's, I would absolutely agree. It's absolutely the same. Some uh, months ago, um, the computer crashed and I didn't have this method for a week. And this was horrible <laughs> because it, it felt like it's really, it felt like being blind. Mm -hmm. I can make instruments and I have ears to listen to the instruments, but without this method, I'm blind. And I love to have, to have ears and eyes and ears. So it's really, it's, you have absolutely the same experience that it helps you this, to measure things, helps you not to be blind. And you need both. Yes. And, and I absolutely would say the results of these measurements, um, because I, I do, uh, do them si since 20 years, it's I can tell when the instrument is finished and I, I see the measurement, I can tell this instrument will be sold immediately or this instrument will be a problem. 
it's and it, it it's just like this i know what people like when i look at the frequency response and on the harmonic structure which which is the most important for me then i can say well just don't do any change to this instrument it's perfect and the other instrument can be i do modifications for three weeks until i like the instrument and so the, the um, open it again and do changes and then i say now i like the instrument so it's it's really like not being blind and do you, think, think, do, you, do you think you can do this because it's your own instruments or do you think if you were seeing other plots you could tell uh, i didn't understand the question i mean do you think that you get you said that you know if you see the plot you kind of you know immediately whether you will be able to set it properly or you will have to modify it is it uh, is it because you've made this violin or do you think you could say it about a plot from a violin that you haven't made? So if I send you a few plots, I mean, you, I, I, yes. which if, one would you like to model? Yeah, well, well, it's very dangerous to compare plots from other measurement systems and other rooms. When I moved the, with the workshop, now I have a whole house for violin making with four floors and I was in another workshop. And I did a lot of measurements and I hoped to be able to tell, to transform the, to the new room and it's not possible. So I don't trust any measurements that other people do. So I, I, it would be very easy if I get instruments into my workshop. I, I had some very fine instruments, some strats, and then I trust them as a reference. So I have some strats which I open as reference instruments and they are always the reference when I make my own. So I, I compare each of my own instruments with two strats, for example. And sometimes I'm really happy and sometimes I'm disappoint, disappointed. And it helps when people come, clients come with very valuable instruments, then it, of course it's a great help to do a measurement. And I can tell them this instrument is very valuable because it's a historical uh, value or artist value. Um, but it's not an acoustic value. Some instruments are very poor in their tonal quality, but very expensive. And this is very easy to see on the, on the plot. And the, the opposite can happen as well, of course. 